we're going to be talking about Kepler and the K2 missions. Um, so Kepler's mission is basically you know, looking in space to see if there are any Earth-sized planets um, or habitable zones um, of sun-like stars. So it's a mission. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about that today and what they look for and then what you know, qualifies a planet as a habitable zone or Earth-like planet. So I hope that you enjoy this lesson. So thinking about just getting started, how common are Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars? So what do you think? Okay, good. So NASA's Kepler mission um, aims to get a more precise answer to this question. So most of the planets that were recently discovered around other stars were closer in mass to Neptune or Jupiter. So if we look here, most of them were about this size. So this is what was found and this is what Kepler is looking for. So mostly finding Jupiter and Neptune. So they really want to find the Earth size ones which is not easy to do um, since, you know, these are bigger, they're easier to see compared to Earth size. So most of the planets that were found were Jupiter or Neptune, but we're looking for Earth size. So they use something called ra radial velocity, um, which is a method that scientists um, use to kind of look at the wobble of a star and to detect planets. So they're looking at how the planet wobbles. So when an unseen planet tugs, um, tugs the star back and forth, so they're looking at that, um, astronomers can detect, detect shifts in spectral fingerprints of the star. So radial velocity usually reveals large planets orbiting stars, but it is not sensitive enough to kind of reveal those Earth-sized planets. So that's why most of the planets that are being revealed are Jupiter and Neptune size, so bigger. So if we think about this, so I'm going to show you the size of Jupiter and then um, kind of compared to the sun, and then show you the size of Earth compared to the sun. So if you look here, this is the size of the sun, and then this is the size of Jupiter. So mostly, you know, those planets are being found, but if we look at the size of Earth or Venus, this is the size of Earth or Venus compared to the sun. So you can see there's a big difference, and it's harder to detect those smaller planets. So stars are very, very far away. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a visual representation here. So say that this is the sun, and then you've got some stars there. So if I keep going, this is our sun, and then that is Earth. Let's keep going. This is the sun. You can't even see Earth anymore. Going. This is the sun, and you can't even see Earth anymore. So, when we think about those things, it's almost nearly impossible. So, this is, would be the sun, and then, so we know that stars are very far away. We cannot see the planet as it crosses in front of a star. So, when we're looking, or when Kepler's mission was looking, it's very hard to tell um, if there are planets the size of Earth. So, most of the time, planets are detected by transits. Um, so, the Kepler mission detects the slight dimming of the star when an Earth-sized planet crosses between the star and us. So they're looking at brightness and then the time in hours. 
So most of the planets are the size of Neptune, um, and then Jupiter, it's harder to find planets the size of Earth. So Kepler's mission was to detect Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable, habitable zones of sun-like stars. So why are they looking for Earth-sized planets? Um, so if the planet is too small, less than half the mass of Earth, like Mercury or Mars, there's not enough gravity to hold on to a life-sustaining atmosphere. So if it's too big, more than about 10 times the mass of Earth, so like the size of Jupiter or Neptune, there's enough gravity to hold on to light gases, hydrogen and helium, and turn it into a gas giant planet. So we need just the right amount of size because the gravity will kind of affect what is being held on to that planet in order for life to survive on that planet. So what is the habitable zone? So an orbit around a star where liquid water might exist on the planet's surface year round. So our solar system and is its habitable zone. Um, it's got um, liquid water and earth. So there is a zone where water can exist on that planet. So habitable, habitable zones are different for each star. So on a cold night, um, if you're thinking of a fire, how close might you stand? You know, maybe there's a candle and then we just have a pit. So we've got a candle here. And then we have, let's say this is like a fire pit, Put some logs in here. And then let's say we have, you know, a massive fire, maybe a brush. And this is a massive one. So when you think about habitable zones, you're going to want to think about which one would you want to stand near. So these different sizes represent different sizes of stars. Okay, so the more massive the star, the hotter the stars are. So mass is going to determine temperature and the lifetime of the star. So habitable zones of cool red stars. So cool red stars are less than the mass of the sun. So the lifetime is many billions to trillions of years. It's a very long time. So we're going to think of those as like very small and close inhabitable zones. So yellow white stars are more like the fire pit. Um, so one to two times the mass of the sun and several billion years to trillions of years again. And then hot blue stars are three to 60 times the mass of the sun. So it's about several million years is the lifetime of those. So there's just not enough time and too much radiation for life to evolve on the really, really hot blue stars. So when you think about this, um, you want to think about where would life be able to evolve in those areas. So the hot blue stars, Probably not because it's too hot. Um, the cool red stars might be, you know, too cold. It's very small, but I would say more of the yellow white stars um, would be more of the area. All right, so now we're going to talk about, you know, what makes a planet habitable. So thinking about, you know, the atmosphere, how thick the atmosphere is. So we have a range of obviously, you know, too hot and too cold. So we've got this range here. So for example, you know, mercury would be too hot. 
so it's too close to the sun. Venus would be cool. It's too heavy. Um, and then also, you know, Earth right here is just right. And then Mars is too far away, so it doesn't get enough light, so it's too cool. And I didn't mean to say Venus. Um, so Venus would be, you know, too hot because it's too heavy. So we've got this range. It also matters if the planet's um, atmosphere and how heavy that atmosphere is um, as well. So we've got temperature and we're going to want to make sure that it's just right. So there are some requirements, you know, for um, our kind of life. So the right elements, you know, carbon, we need hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, iron, magnesium. And then again, we need that stable environment. So it needs to be the right temperature. We need water, energy sources, light, chemicals. So in order for life to survive, you need all of those things. Um, to have the right atmosphere, it has to be just the right distance away from, you know, the main en energy source, the sun, or the main star. So, when we think about, you know, this, we also want to think about the um, stable environment of the planet. So, planets usually have, you know, near circular orbits. So, when you have a planet, and if you want a habitable life, you're not going to want a huge eclipse with hot and cold times. So you're going to want more of like a balance. So if this is the sun here, you're going to want it to be, in most orbits are a little bit of an eclipse, but you're not going to want something like huge like this, where it's going to have really hot times and really cold times. You know what, more of that even um, near circular orbit. So it's getting an even balance as it's orbiting the sun. So the sun also needs to be stable. Um, the sun sunspot cycle is very, very minor. So we're not getting hot waves, cold waves, things like that. Um, so we also don't want many asteroids or comets um, in that solar system. And there are few nearby stars, so near pass would disrupt planet orbits, um, explosion would fill solar system with, you know, lethal radiation. So you only want kind of one main star that is providing the energy for those planets. So again, the temperature in the solar system, so heat needs to come mostly from the star and it's going to decrease when you are away from it. So the yellow zone is liquid water at planet's surface. So there's different zones as you get further away. Um, you don't want to go too far or too close. You want to be in the yellow zone, which is known as, you know, kind of the right temperature for liquid water can be on the planet. So stars get hotter as they age, so yellow zone will keep moving out. Um, so planet rotation smooths out temperature as well. Um, and then a main source of life when you, if you're on a planet, you're going to need water. So why liquid water? It's going to allow easy movement of molecules to and from reactions. It's allowing creation of complex molecules as well. Um, H2O is abundant in the solar system and is versatile. Um, liquid ammonia and hydrocarbons, methane, ethane are also possible. So where in the solar system could we find liquid water? 
So Earth, certainly. Mars, maybe in the past, um, maybe now. Um, Europe, Europa, it, there's liquid water, ocean blue, under the ice, rocky mantle, um, and metal core. And then Venus, possibly in the distant past. Um, so there is a dwarf planet that I'm going to talk about, a little bit about, um, Cirrus. Um, so the average diameter is 942 kilometers. The density is 2.07 grams, um, mix of rock and water. So polar flattening suggests a rotating fluid glob, so ice or water shell, over the rock. So there may be liquid water depending on how much internal heat um, there is from the radioactivity. And then also Titan, um, another solvent, so it's got a dense atmosphere, thick cloud cover, orange color, and hydrocarbon smog as well. So the radar images um, on the spacecraft shows that riverbeds and lakes are on the surface. Um, lakes probably are made of liquid, liquid hydrocarbons like methane and ethane. So thinking about that, you know, there are there planets around other stars? Do they have stable environments? So planets are very, very common. Hundreds now known. Most known are not good for life. So most are hot gas giants or they have really high elliptical orbits, which are going to cause unstable environments. Part of, you know, the time it's revolving around, it's going to be really cold. The other part is going to be really hot. So you want that stable environment. So thinking about extrasolar planets, so water vapor um, on hot Jupiter, um, 4.5 million kilometers from the star Mercury, it's about a 2.2 day orbit surface. So is it habitable? Um, so there's something called Gliese 581c, which is, like a, they call it super Earth. So a red dwarf star, um, it's 50 times diameter the sun. Um, and then it, it's half again as big as Earth, five times more massive. So what type of star can you, what type of star do you need um, to kind of support a planet that wouldn't be able to have life or be like Earth? So only some stars um, are suitable. Hot, large stars explode too soon. They also make too much UV radiation, which would be deadly to life. Also, um, variable flare stars. Flare stars don't provide stable environments, so that wouldn't work. You can't have, you know, temperatures ranging all of the time. And then white dwarfs are remnants after star explosions, so they're not going to provide life either. The giants and supergiants aren't going to, you know, provide that stable environment as well. So we've all heard about multiple stars. So most stars are double, triple, or more. So some have planets. Planet orbits are stable only near a star or far from them all. So a multiple star system is as bad for life as it is its worst star. So, and multiple stars have many restricted habitable zones and more variable planetary environments. So does the star need to be young or old to provide life? Um, so most important, you know, trace elements like iron um, are needed. Heavier elements form in star explosions as well. So star explosions release these atoms as dust. And, you know, more star generations have more of those elements, you know, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. So younger multi-generation stars are more likely to have solid planets. So where in the galaxy can life survive? So it has to be far from the core. So because intense radiation from its huge black hole 
if there's too many stars, it will disrupt planet's orbits. And if it's in from the rim, rim stars tend to be older, poor in those elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. Outside galaxy arms, there's too many stars, it will disrupt planet's orbits again. So that is all that I have um, about this lesson on, you know, habitable, plan hab habitable planets and Kepler's mission. So I'm interesting to hear your, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I will see you later. Goodbye.